It all started about 10 years or so back when two security men who were working up on the bypass came into the police station one Monday morning to report that they'd seen a ghost. Both of them were known to me through the time they'd spent up there doing the security job. Uh, they told me they'd seen a headless figure on the new Piroy Bridge and basically I couldn't offer them any advice and more jokingly than anything else at that time I told them that it was the church they required and not the police and off they went up to Stocksbridge to actually seek, as it turned out, to seek sanctuary in the church. Dick Ellis is a no-nonsense policeman in the small steel-making town of Stocksbridge in Yorkshire. The town straggles along a narrow valley on the eastern slopes of the Pennines and is dominated by the big central structure of the steelworks. In 1987, they began to build a bypass to carry traffic up across the hills. And things began to happen. One night, for example, two big, tough security men experienced something so strange and so unnerving that they took their story to the police. They were there basically to frighten people away. They were the type of if a group of lads were up there nicking something, they got out of the Land Rover. The Land Rover would raise up in the air by a foot because of the size, and you'd run. They were there to put the fear of God up people, and they were, it worked well. They were really genuinely nice blokes. And the morning they came down to Deep Car to report it, they were both very, very shaken. Something had scared them. Understandably enough, the initial police response was pretty skeptical, but there's no doubt the security men had been very severely frightened. They claimed their Land Rover had been bounced and rocked around with them in it by something they could neither see nor explain. It had scared them stiff. What really sort of um, made it worse in many ways and convinced me that something serious had happened was that 12 hours later, uh, I sent them home uh, and, and got some medical uh, attention and the, the, the vicar, uh, the Stocksbridge vicar was involved. Uh, and I got them to come back in the office about seven, eight o'clock that night and saw them again. And they were really no better. They'd quiet down a little bit, but the, their nerves were absolutely shot. Uh, and clearly they had been, uh, well, traumatized. Within a matter of weeks, both men had given up their jobs. So their lives had certainly been changed by their psychic experience. As for the police, since the report had gone into the logbook, Dick Ellis was told to investigate it. A few nights later, he decided to spend some time up at the roadworks with a colleague, observing what went on. We parked up about 100 yards from the bridge where the sighting had been, and we sat there in the darkness, radios off. Nothing happening around us, just waiting. We'd been there a good 20 minutes, possibly a little bit longer, by now, my eyesight had adjusted well to the darkness. It was a lovely clear night. The stars were out all the lot. It was a very pleasant evening, nice and warm. And we could see something moving on the bridge. John B, the special was with me. I could see he was paying attention to the bridge. I was looking at the bridge because something was moving. After a while, we both mentioned it to each other and we walked up to the bridge, looked and we couldn't see anything. We went back to the car, got in the car. Obviously, when you get in the car, the lights come on so you lose what you could call your night vision. Again, after a few minutes, we adjusted back to the darkness and the same thing was moving. It was moving sideways on the bridge. This time, I took a torch from the car, gone up, climbed on the ladder onto the bridge, and thankfully, we found that there was quite a few, there was pallets of large concrete blocks that were covered in polythene sheeting. That was moving about quite freely in the breeze. I fastened it down with the bricks. We got back down, got back in the car, again after a few moments till we'd adjusted, it had stopped. We were relieved. We weren't frightened, we hadn't spoke to selves. We were quite openly joking about it, thinking if anybody knew we were here, they'd think we were absolutely raving mad. So we weren't hyped up expecting anything to happen, we were calm. And we were almost getting to the point where we thought, let's leave it, nothing's gonna happen. And uh, it's hard to explain what happened. We were sat in a Vauxhall Astra, in a three-door Astra. The windows were both down, so you've got quite a wide doorway with a large window sill. My arm was out of the window. I was looking in the rear view mirror and also in both side wing mirrors, expecting at any time somebody to try to sneak up on us and set us up. So I was ready for that. When they give the term when somebody walks over your grave when you go deathly cold, I just suddenly went so cold I couldn't speak. I can't remember if I stopped breathing, but I would say not. I could get my breath, but I knew that from nowhere, suddenly somebody was here. 
and when I say this close, I mean this close, somebody was pushed against the car window with the entire torso region being pressed through the open window. The strange thing was I couldn't feel anything on my arm and my arm would have been out, so anything there would have actually been pressing against my arm, but I couldn't feel that. I just knew that somebody's chest area was pressed against the window. I couldn't speak to tell John because I just froze. I was thinking, Cry, how the hell did this thing get here? When as quickly as I could think that, it had gone. All my senses came back. I momentarily casted my head to the side and it had definitely gone. Now, I was just about to say to John something along the lines, what was that? When he let out such a scream and ended up physically off the seat, up towards the ceiling roof of the car and just screamed. I jumped out of the police car, ran round the back, expecting what had gone from my side was now at his side to find nothing. I asked him what he'd seen and he said that at the same time as I'd sensed something was on my side, he'd sensed something had appeared on his side. Might have been a split second, obviously, with his scream and with the way I'd felt. I then told him to stop in the car. I got the torch. I even looked under the car. I looked all the way around it. I looked up the bank into the left, looked up the bank into the right. There was nothing there. Nobody could have got on us that quick and then got away that quick. To double check on this, the bypass then was just mud and all there was was tyre tracks and there was actually our footprints where we twice walked up to the ridge and come back so with no footprints. So we didn't know what to make of it. We got back in the car, I drove up to the bridge, there was a dirt track taking you up onto the opioid lane although the bridge wasn't open and we parked up on the top and we were sat in the car when something hit the car from behind. The car didn't physically move although it felt as though somebody had hit us or run into the back with the crashing noise. We both then jumped out of the car thinking, something's hit us obviously. And I went to the back of the car, and again, there was nothing there at all. But within the space of a few seconds, something hit the back of the police car four or five times. Now, it wasn't long, using this just as a for instance, it wasn't long after the minor strike had finished and we had been used to being in police vehicles which had been attacked with people, with sticks, baseball bats, clubs, call them what you want. And it was that same kind of banging on the back of the car as though somebody was hitting it with a large implement, wood, metal, whatever. We then thought, this is odd. Uh, I didn't get the strange feeling back again, the feeling of coldness, but we didn't like it this time. This was scary. As with the night watchman, the car wasn't damaged in any way but there can be no question about the genuineness of Dick Ellis' experience. It takes a lot of courage for a policeman to talk about seeing ghosts in front of his colleagues. Dick went further. He put a full report into the station log. And over the following months, there were several similar reports. Many of them mentioned a monk-like figure, dark, hooded, sometimes moving quickly up the embankment or through a car's headlights. When you're parked up, you had to find a, a place where you could put your trailer. Because there were that many trailers in, you got to find an empty space. Anyway, I found the space, and I stopped again to, in the wide part to take my ropes off to back the trailer in. But while I was taking the ropes off down the near side of the trailer, I suddenly went very cold. And it was a warm night. I went very cold, and I got a musty smell. And glancing up, I saw this figure of a monk just gliding through the headlights and disappear among the other trailers. I wasn't frightened, but I was a little bit unnerved when I saw it. And quite a few times after that, at that time, I got that same smell, but I never saw that figure again. And that particular night when I saw it, I told the boss when I got back, he says, oh, you've seen it as well. Monks, even ghostly monks, aren't the sort of thing you would normally connect with a steel town. But when we looked into the history of the valley, we found to our surprise that there were clear links. There had been two monasteries close by that went back as far as the 12th century. One of them was of the Cistercian order, which has a very strict code. And we uncovered a local legend of a monk who had broken his code left the monastery to take a job on a local farm. When he died, he had to be buried in unconsecrated ground up on the hillside. 
very close, it seems, to the line of the cutting for the new bypass. Had the roadworks disturbed a still troubled spirit? The Stocksbridge bypass was completed in 1989. It now carries a steady stream of traffic up over the Pennines, but it has something of an unhappy record. In fact, it's become an accident black spot. There's even been some suggestion that some of the accidents may be due to the strange sightings, because they've gone on. Ordinary people who have no doubt, they've seen something not of this world, which they can't forget. We were coming over the top Grenner Road, um, over the bypass and into a, a village called um, Wortley. And as I was driving, I looked to the left hand side and uh, there was a figure of what looked like a um, human being, just the outline of a body and a head. Um, I couldn't actually see any um, facial expressions, it was just a body, uh, arms and legs, torso. Then I looked again, I saw my husband was looking, uh, and there wasn't actually any feet touching the ground, it was elevated, perhaps about 12 inches, and the arms and legs were all distorted and just moving in weird directions, so it was really weird. And then, within seconds, really, from seeing this figure in the middle of the field, um, it was at the bottom of an embankment, and the embankment that obviously led up onto the road where we were driving. And um, within seconds from being at the bottom of the embankment, um, it rose into the air and actually kind of fell in front of the car. I mean, I slowed down very, very quickly to put my foot on the brake, but just to my amazement, to both our amazements, it just vanished. It was a strange, a strange feeling. Uh, it brought goosebumps up on my arms. Um, and I can only have one thought in my mind that it was, it was an apparition or it was a ghost. Uh, as we turned the corner, um, he walked into what can only be described as opening a great big freezer door and walking into it and it felt like a brick wall at the same time. It was immensely cold. And we just carried on walking up the lane after it sort of took us breath for a second. And he finished up with his legs shaking uncontrollably. And we knew for a fact they weren't shaking. And uh, as we went up the lane and slowly walked up the lane, to entrance to this field, all the back of your neck started to crawl, your scalp, and it just felt as though your hair was beginning to stand on end. And the oppression started to come. It was really bad, heavy. We could see what can only be described as a monk racing around the field at great pace. Uh, one minute he was stood at the top corner, and then he was off, he was missing, then he was there again near the entrance to the uh, field. He's actually prancing around. There have been many sightings like that. A strange human-like figure, half seen, half not seen. It seems to be able to move with great speed across the fields and roads. But other sightings are quite different. They're filled with immense detail about the clothes and the appearance and manner of the apparition. This particular night, Nigel decided to come with me and we set off running and um, we got up to Wortley quite a bit later than what I would normally run if I was running on my own. And um, on the way back, it was coming dusk. And as I was running in front of Nigel, I saw in front of me, just as I was pulling into a lay-by to mark time for Nigel to catch me up, a guy walking with his back to the traffic. And I thought, well, this is dangerous. And I looked over my shoulder and Nigel was getting close to me. And then I realised that this guy wasn't walking on the road, he was walking in the road. And at first, first I couldn't, my eyes were telling me that he was doing this, and I didn't, just couldn't believe what I was seeing. And the guy was actually getting nearer, and he was actually walking. I could only see from 
probably about there, uh, about a foot of him was walking in the road and he was in very old dark brown clothes and he got a cape on and the cape as he got near I could see he was buttoned every half inch down and it was there was like eyelets it wasn't buttonholes like we have nowadays it was like eyelets and the face was just like black like a chapel comes out of the mine but it was a dull brown and there was no actual face it was just like black sockets where his face was and he was he got a big bag with him and it was like trailing in the ground and Nigel stood at side of me and I turned to look at him and uh, his hair was standing on, on end and I could feel all the hair at the back of my hair standing up and as I looked back to say something to Nigel when we looked back again he just disappeared. It's difficult to believe what I've just seen because it, uh, it came to us like a normal person and as he got close you could see there were no, couldn't see like below um, just below his knees, and you just got a feeling the a fear inside to run as fast as we could, and it was strange because you could tell straight away it wasn't normal. The um, facial features and everything, no eyes, a nose. The funny thing about it was there was this queer, musty smell, and I never said anything to Nigel, but Nigel says, "Poor Dad, didn't he smell?" And that was the. That was it, he just disappeared and there was just this fusty smell as he disappeared. That account clearly carries the ring of truth about it. And the fact that the figure seemed to be walking on a lower ground level, the ground level that existed in previous centuries, also tallies with our research in other parts of the country, where the apparitions are associated with much earlier times. But the big question is, of course, what do we think is going on around Stocksbridge? There are large deposits of iron ore in the region, which would affect the local magnetic field. There are overhead power lines and big electrical substations near the steel smelters. Could they be having some sort of triggering effect? Some scientists have argued that uh, if you place the human brain, or at least particular types of human brain, those with um, a, l a large amount of flux or activity in the temporal lobes, into a very strong magnetic field, you'll be able to induce an anomalous experience. Now, the evidence for that comes from laboratory-based studies where they have placed very strong magnetic fields across um, the, the brain, across the temporal lobes in particular, and people have reported very strange um, uh, experiences. Now, whether you could ever get those sorts of strength of field you know, out in the real world, under power lines or by power station, for example, is a different issue. There's no evidence that you can actually achieve those sorts of flux out there in the field. But still, you know, it's an attempt at a normal explanation to explain paranormal phenomena. But magnetic effects or not, speak to the people who've had these experiences at quite different times and places, and there can be no doubt about the powerful impact on them. Not just the profound emotional nature of the experience, but the quality of the recall, the detail of a coat fastening, or the line of a collar, or the thud of something invisible hitting a car. Science finds these accounts of the paranormal almost impossible to deal with because they seem to lie outside all the established laws. I think uh, the resistance of other scientists, that is those who've looked at the data, comes from the um subversiveness of what we're saying, that there, that there is a lot more to uh, human personality than they have allowed for. Science has spent a very long time building up a particular worldview, and that excludes the existence of paranormal phenomena by definition. Now, if we're going to try and include those phenomena, we're going to have to radically change that worldview. And we only want to do that if the evidence is extremely good. We don't want to make a mistake and say, yep, ghosts exist, we do survive death, and then find out that we've got it radically wrong. So science, by its nature, is a very conservative process. You slowly collect the evidence, you present it to peer groups, see what they think. If it's accepted, it slowly becomes integrated into scientific theory. But it's very early days yet, and, and certainly a lot of the paranormal phenomena would mean that we do have to radically change how scientists see the world. What is at stake, of course, is huge. Nothing less than the most profound challenge to our view of the way the human machine works. Conventional science would have us believe that we are essentially bundles of molecules that come together for a brief spell of time before dispersing back into the environment. 
But these widespread and unexplained psychic events might perhaps lift the veil onto another kind of reality. The possibility that there is an entity, a something that we call the mind, that might be capable of a sort of independent existence, able to survive the dissolution of the body, even take on an apparent form. It's an uncomfortable question, but one that an increasing number of scientists are now prepared to contemplate. Well, I think uh, the mind is primary, consciousness is primary and uh, I think irreducible. And it uses brains, or a brain, uh, while we're living, but may persist after the death of the physical brain. My own prediction would be that, uh, in fact, we would see that mind and brain are not the same and that the non-locality theory, which is now achieving quite a lot of um, attention among scientists, and that is that the mind is separate from brain but is normally operating through it, that this would uh, perhaps be established within science and that we would find that it is indeed direct contact between mind and mind that allows for these phenomena like telepathy to actually happen. I try to monitor the literature of uh, neuroscience and uh, read the books by neuroscientists and um, authorities on memory who are totally convinced that um, memory is in the brain and couldn't be anywhere else and that personality also is in the brain and that, uh, this or that part of the brain is damaged then that will produce this or that change of personality and there's no doubt that they have made great progress so it's all right this is the say this is the decade of the brain but uh, i've hoped that the uh, next decade, or some decade in the 21st century, might be the decade of the mind. An increasing number of scientists would agree with Ian Stevenson that we need a new science, a science of the mind. But after almost 100 years of paranormal research, there are those who believe that a proper understanding of it might always lie beyond our grasp. The universe may simply be too complicated and by the universe, I mean the physical astronomical universe, but also the universe of pa the paranormal. Maybe just too complicated for us ever to understand. We can map it, we can study it, we can experiment with it, but it may well be that we will never understand it. Maybe, however, 21st century, some new aspect will come in which will give us a clue as to what is the best way of at least maximizing our knowledge about what the paranormal is.